since I started making horror retrospectives full time, I've covered the big boy topics off my favourite horror film, my favourite horror guilty pleasure, and my choice for scariest film. However, while objectivity does not exist, a fitting statement for the topic of this video, if I were to finally answer that ultimate intimidating question of what I think is the greatest horror film of all time, I might as well just spread my butt cheeks and prepare for a pounding because it's an answer that will never satisfy the internet, especially if it's an answer as cliched as this one apparently. But the problem is, we throw around greatest slash worst thing ever way too passively for it to have any real meaning anymore. I mean, if I'm going on my own personal list of favourite films, it's naturally a mixed bag of varying degrees of quality, ranging from films that had a real impact on my life to films that I watch for a trashy cheap thrill or pure nostalgia. Even if I am the kind of snobby twat who, upon hearing someone say something like, oh that movie wasn't scary, desperately wants to scream, you just don't get it. Look, when it comes to horror, just because it isn't considered the scariest doesn't mean that it can't be considered the greatest and vice versa. I get pretty antsy when it comes to how misconceived and misrepresented the genre usually is, especially when you consider how disingenuous pop culture can sometimes be at glorifying the sensationalist parts of the genre, as opposed to how culturally, historically or aesthetically significant it can be, a definition that was defined by the National Film Registry as a way of promoting a general consensus as to what should warrant the title of greatest thing ever. I guess I'll say William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist is not only one of the most truly haunting films I've ever seen, but it reaches past all the pop culture appeal I feel has sometimes held the horror genre back and perfectly demonstrates how horror is more than simply about being scary. The Exorcist proudly shared how crucial and meaningful horror was to the world and critical discourse by profoundly exploring human fears and anxieties related to doubt, uncertainty and the never-ending unknowingness that surrounds our existence, without all the philosophical jargon to wet down and alienate people into calling it pretentious drivel. And hell, if we're not going to give it the title of greatest horror, we can at least give it greatest adaptation considering William Blatty, as the original author of the book, wrote and produced the adaptation himself, will William Friedkin being the only director he ever wanted touching his seminal work. I can confidently call The Exorcist an unrelentingly significant piece of filmmaking, because not only does it balance complex, intriguing storytelling with existentially chilling ideas and imagery, but The Exorcist is also a powerful reminder of what we mean when we say cinema can be truly magical. In a sort of messed up kind of way. Your mother sucks cocks and hell, oh, Paris, you prayer. faithless oh, swine. So let's talk about it. I think a large part of The Exorcist's legacy is the fact that it has the reputation of being the first horror film to get rightfully nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture, alongside nine other nominations including cinematography, editing, direction, production design and three acting categories, eventually winning adapted screenplay and sound mixing. Sure, Oscars aren't exactly awards built from integrity as they are money and power, but generally speaking they do represent a very mild mainstream and industry consensus, at least in the realm of Hollywood's dominance in the global market. The achievements of The Exorcist cannot be understated, as they represented a significant historical victory for horror overcoming the adversary of elitist gatekeeping snobs who didn't take horror seriously as a form of artistic expression, along with the bombardment of controversies and obstacles that could have severely impacted its performance. Of course, you had Blatty's regular disputes with Warner Brothers over practically every aspect of production, with Warner Brothers assuming it was destined for failure anyway after not being able to attach any major stars to the project. And this was on top of principal photography coming with its own set of problems from going over budget to injuries to the friggin set apparently catching fire. In fact, Warner Brothers decided to not even screen it to critics and give it a limited release. But the immense audience reaction eventually forced Warner Warner's hand into a wide release, and the mix to negative critical reception did not stop audiences from devouring it again and again. 
In short, it was a genuine fucking miracle that the film turned out the way that it did. But production issues aside, the real heart of the conflict and controversy came from the contents of the film itself. At the time, it was nothing new to see a film with disturbing graphic imagery, and it sure as hell wasn't anywhere near as provocative as what the Italians were probably up to, but it was another thing to come with socially taboo subject matter that involved both children and Christianity in the same context, and not for the reasons we think about today. By the 70s, things like stranger danger, kidnappers, killers and outsiders were becoming the prominent domestic fear in society that soon gave rise to the slasher era of horror cinema. I mean, sure, The Exorcist is supernatural, but putting a child in life-threatening danger and seeing them suffer at the hands of a seemingly unforgiving evil wasn't a common sight in cinema. In fact, even today, it's still greatly discouraged. Bear in mind, The Exorcist does have a detective noir murder mystery theme to it that gives the film a subtextual slasher killer element indicative of real domestic terror that further grounds the supernatural elements in reality. During the time of its release, Friedkin was fighting with the MPAA to reduce the film's rating from an X to an R so that the film could reach the largest audience possible, or in other words, it would allow kids to see it. When the rating was eventually changed, naturally you had parents and officials trying to get the film banned for obscenity because it was seen as deeply traumatizing to children and potentially having a negative effect on society. Yeah, it wasn't a movie for kids, but it demonstrated a haunting reality of being helpless to your own children children being hurt, traumatized, and well, for lack of a better word, abused by an evil force, especially in what should be the safety of your own home. While you had all the hyperbolic claims of barf bags, fainting, leaving the theatre in mass hysteria and even heart attacks, what The Exorcist did more prolifically was tap into how the fantasy of horror could be used to symbolise grisly, morbid actualities in a medium that was predominantly viewed as a means of escaping the big, bad, scary world. Of course, today, people are more likely to dismiss it as nothing more than part of the exaggerated snowflake generation because we're now so desensitized to its material and subject matter. The Exorcist was more than just a generic cheap thrill possession movie that's now softened by future imitators. It doesn't actually become a proper conventional horror movie until around two-thirds into it. Before that, it's actually a fierce piece of social criticism that presents a very harrowing, brooding human drama about a crisis of faith over both spiritual uncertainty and our over-reliance on science and technology to solve all our problems. The story follows two interwoven conflicts that eventually intersect one another, the first being about a mother trying to figure out why her daughter Regan has become batshit insane, and the other being a priest who wants to leave the church after having severe doubts about his religion. In between this, it's subtly thread together with the discovery of an ancient demon king known as Pazuzu, who eventually possesses Regan and brings the Catholic Church's deep dark secret, not that secret, of performing exorcisms to the forefront. Generally speaking, it is one tightly compact and focused piece of storytelling. Not a single moment or line of dialogue is ever wasted. It manages to deliver an incredibly rich lore brought to life through vivid exposition that feels naturally presented and convincing while still maintaining a perfect level of ambiguity to keep the eerie mystery behind the church and their spiritual encounters alive. It never lays all its cards on the table, and what it does show you is backed up with historical and cultural context to make it feel fitting and believable. I know I usually drone on about how ambiguity is king because it goes back to that writer fallacy where if you attempt to over deliver on detail and fall short, you expose yourself to plot holes and contradictions in logic. But The Exorcist is a confident motherfucker in that regard. It firmly sticks to what it knows based on the true and accurate circumstances that inspired Blatty's story. For example, Father Lancaster Marin, who uncovers the ancient demon king in the opening and is the one who comes to exorcise Regan, is based on British archaeologist Gerald Lancaster Harding, who excavated the Qumran Caves in Jerusalem to uncover the Dead Sea Scrolls that became canon within the Hebrew Bible. Blatty's characters constantly refer to the debates surrounding fraudulence and skepticism, with a heavy emphasis on Regan's medical and psychological evaluations, using accurate science that was even deemed controversial by some, considering the Anglo 
choreography was allegedly performed as a real procedure. And then of course you have the possession and exorcism cases themselves. While the story is pretty clear that this is a demonic possession, it still surrounds itself with authentic procedures and research conducted by the church to prove an exorcism is needed since it's viewed as an extremely dangerous process that has led to deaths as a result of misdiagnosis, malpractice, and of course, confusing supernatural forces with delusion, psychological instability, and even mere attention seeking. In fact, before the demon is truly established, Regan is just made out to be going through a psychotic episode episode, theorised by doctors to be the result of her troubled family life, adolescence and perceived isolation. The most notable real-life event used by Blatty was the 1949 exorcism of an unnamed 14-year-old boy under the pseudonym Roland Doe. It's basically summarised as a bunch of priests observing bizarre supernatural shenanigans that are recreated in the film. Along with an abundance of sceptics who dismissed the otherworldly happenings as pure bollocks, with one of the most prominent criticisms being that the boy was just an elaborate drama queen thriving off all the attention. To get across the authenticity of exorcisms and establish a firm sense of believability, the world building is cemented in the relatable tribulations and pressures of everyday life, with a certain degree of necessary monotony that allows the fantasy to seep its way organically into the story. While pop culture will obsess over the makeup and the effects, it's how intensely psychological the film is that really drives home the scares. It's not just some evil that throws shit around the room and hurls insults, it torments manipulation manipulates and breaks you down. The entire impact of the horror is how small and hopeless it makes you feel to someone or something that is able to touch a soft spot within you and expose you to your deepest fears, insecurities and tragedies. While it's certainly manifested through Regan's apparent isolation and loneliness as she tries to send cries for help through her possessed body, it's also shown in her mother trying to throw her money and influence at the problem, and more significantly, through Father Damien Karras, who for the record is one of my favourite characters in fiction. The story is very heavy on the whole science versus faith debate, which became another major aspect to its controversy, placing Damien in the middle as he sees spiritual faith as causing just as much harm as the science that the rest of society has put its own faith into. Even if the doctors examining Regan end up submitting to defeat and becoming dismissive once their precious science feels them and they just resort to ignorantly guessing what's wrong. I feel the story is more reliant on Damien's perspective by adding a very neutral perspective on the matter, showing both the goods and bads of two conflicting faith systems, one that grants a psychological sense of purpose and power, and the other we've cultivated to be the taken for granted objective solution to all of life's problems because society has constructed what we deem rational and logical to be. Damien then starts to face his real demons when his mother passes away and he's left feeling completely helpless, so his character arc becomes about literally confronting horrors to eventually redeem himself in the end by having the demon let go of Regan and take him instead, to which he commits suicide. <laughs> There's this overriding motif about evidence and responsibility that's found in both parties trying to help Regan. The difference being that the doctors are less concerned purely because they have no personal stake in Regan's destruction, while Damien has nothing but personal connection to helping her because he couldn't help his mother. Thus he becomes a bit of a father figure in the absence of Regan's real father who we never meet. He's harder on himself than he should be, but we all feel that overwhelming sense of weakness when there's nothing we can do to solve a problem, especially when a vulnerable child is put in an agonizing traumatizing position that no child should ever be in. Then of course we also have the major theme of a mother trying to protect her child but can't, playing on the idea that no money or power can fix everything, contrasting with the more working class status of Damien, who openly acknowledges how we constantly put our faith in false assumptions and idols, and quickly discard them and move on to the next faith system until something finally works for us. The demon is made strong by how disconnected society is from a strong sense of faith. It shows the world to be insincere and lacking conviction in their personal truths, ironically showing Damien to be the only one who can see the world for what it is, despite showing the most explicit crisis of faith. 
That's ultimately what The Exorcist was aiming to be. It uses horror to explore the human condition and our relationship with the world. I think it's a pretty cerebral experience than what we're familiar with. It is a drama that has horror elements. It takes all the conventional politics and character arcs we've become so used to in fiction and completely subverts them with the added twist of a supernatural presence. You don't necessarily have all the answers in the end and it's somewhat anticlimactic you could even argue, but for a reputation as profound as this one, it's actually a fairly positive conclusion. We are so used to horror falling into mean-spirited nihilism, whereas for a film as considerably controversial and taboo as this one, The Exorcist alleviates you and the characters from their anxieties. In the end, the oppressive atmosphere is released, leaving you more with a smile on your face than one of raw terror. But that's not to say it doesn't sit with you long after. The horror looks to confront the things that scare us and help us to overcome them, or at the very least, make better sense of them. Damien's journey is about embracing his doubts and providing hope to a mother and daughter who are lost in the world's unpredictable and inconsequential madness. At the end of the day, sometimes we need to experience these fears and worries because they can lead to a reminder that, amongst all the chaos and neglect in the world we see on a regular basis, hope can still exist. Thank you.